Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Josh McKinnis. I'm a master's student at the University of British Columbia's Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries and Marine Mammal Research Unit. I'm supervised by Dr. Andrew Treitz. Um, I'm excited for this today, this presentation. Um, but first, um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries is based on the UBC Point Grey campus, which is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Uh, you may be joining us from traditional lands across British Columbia, Canada, and the world, and we know, and we would like to acknowledge the owners and caretakers of those lands as well. I'm very excited to be introducing our presenter today, Dr. Michelle Larue. Uh, Dr. Michelle Larue is a marine ecologist and public speaker at the University of Canter Canterbury, where it is currently 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning. So thank you very much for joining us, Michelle. Hope you've had a coffee. Um, she focuses her research on the biogeography of penguins and seals in Antarctica, and also on mountain lions in North America. Michelle started her research career as an undergraduate intern at Minnesota State University, Man Mankato, graduating in 2005 and focused her master's research at Southern Illinois University on the eastward range expansion of cougars in the Midwestern North America. Since 2007, Michelle has been doing research in Antarctica and she gained her PhD in conservation biology in 2014 with a project that focused on using high resolution satellite imagery to assess wildlife populations around the Antarctic coastline. She has co-authored more than three dozen peer reviewed papers and has spent eight seasons leading Antarctic field teams. Michelle is a passionate communicator having given invited presentations um, at the Gordon Research Center, the World Science Conference in Brisbane and other places. Her internationally recognized research has been covered by articles in the Wall Street Journal, National Geographic, NBC Nightly News, BBC and NPR. Um, I'm going to welcome you, Michelle. Um, I'm very looking forward to your presentation as we all are. And um, yeah, so take it away. Kia ora koutou, uh, tēnā koutou katoa e ngā mana whenua o tēnā rohe, tēnā koutou. Uh, ko Mississippi te awa, uh, no Minnesota aho, no te whare wananga o Waitaha ao, uh, ko Michelle Rue toku ingoa. No reara, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Hello, everybody. Um, I would like to begin this presentation um, by telling you what I just said um, in Te Reo Māori, which is the uh, indigenous language of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, what we do here is often uh, we begin presentations and, and meetings and get togethers with a bit of a, a mihi. So I've just told you a little bit about myself. Um, I welcomed you all from the indigenous lands from wherever you are zooming in from um, and have acknowledged the indigenous people um, of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I'm originally from Minnesota. I grew up near the Mississippi River and I'm now currently at the University of Canterbury. Um, and my name is Michelle LaRue. So that's what I have, um, have just done as far as uh, the, my little me here here. So I'm really um, excited to be here today. Thank you all for being here and for this invitation. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about um, our project, which I call Many Hands Make Like Work. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about how we worked with citizen scientists and volunteers to reveal um, a lot about wet oil seals in Antarctica over the past five years or so. And so specifically what I want to talk about is um, first of all, I'm going to introduce why wet oil seals, why are, you know, why this particular species and not others. Um, and then I'll get into um, kind of the discovery of being able to see them from space focusing then on one of the more pristine parts of our oceans called the Ross Sea. Um, and then I'll get into a little bit of the mechanics of the power of the crowd. I promise not to get um, too into the weeds statistically, but kind of just covering the overarching uh, approach and what we ended up finding. And then finally, um, talking about the first population estimate, uh, which we just published recently. And even more, we ended up learning, I think, a lot more than I ever anticipated. So with that kind of as the framework, I like to begin these presentations by reminding us all a little bit about Antarctica. So this is a map of Antarctica. <laughs> it is the highest, driest, coldest, and windiest continent on the planet. And if you have been to any Antarctic talks, I'm sure you've probably heard that before. Um, but I mention this because it's a really difficult place to do research. Um, it's the same size as the United States and Mexico put together. Um, and most of it's covered in ice. 
it's just it's a it's a really difficult place to do uh, to do work sometimes. Um, but probably the other really really cool thing about Antarctica is that it's very well protected um, through the Antarctic Treaty, which was signed in um, December first, nineteen fifty nine. And what that did was it set aside the continent for peace and for science. So there's no military operations. Um, there's no. Um, it's only for peace and science, basically. And that's fantastic, but the thing that I like to remind us all is that the ocean surrounding Antarctica doesn't have the same types of protections as the continent does. Um, and the surrounding oceans have been exploited for centuries, um, hunting first for seals and whales. And then by about the 1950s, 1960s, um, there, was, there was a lot of effort um, to fish for krill. So in other words, in, in kind of in my view, we're starting to kind of fish down the food web, right? We're, we're getting now to some of the smallest animals in the Southern Ocean. And in this particular case, krill are the keystone species in the Southern Ocean. So the Southern Ocean can't really function very well without, uh, without krill. And so in seeing this, you know, Antarctic Treaty happening and a couple decades later, we're starting to fish for krill. Many of the Antarctic Treaty Nation scientists got together and said, maybe we should make sure that we don't do things to the system that can't be undone. And so in 1982, CAMELAR was born. And I'll say this once, uh, CAMELAR stands for the Commission on the Conservation for Antarctic Marine Living Resources. It's a bit of a mouthful, but what that organization or what this governing body does is it manages and um, enacts conservation in the Southern Ocean, allowing for rational use of resources. And one of the key pieces that I like to bring forward, there's lots of pieces to the Camelar Convention, but one of the key pieces I bring forward is it's this idea of looking at the ecosystem as a whole. So not managing for a single species, but making sure that the whole ecosystem can function as it should with the idea of preventing um, things happening to the ecosystem that basically can't be undone. And so I kind of keep that in the back of my mind as, as one of the frameworks, um, and that's an important piece of information for this presentation. Um, and so of course, one of the ways in which we study whether or not things are happening to the system that can't be undone is by studying indicator species like penguins and seals. And so now I'm introducing the Weddell seal, which is this uh, creature that you see on the upper right hand um, portion of the screen. They are a very large phocid seal and weighing anywhere from about 300 to 500 kilograms. And they focus their um, habitat, their breeding habitat, primarily um, on the fast ice. So the ice that's fastened to the Antarctic continent, sea ice, um, around the entire continent. Um, they are, large, they come back to the same places each year, so they're phylopatric. Um, they can live upwards of 30 years. Their survival rates, once they get to be a certain age, probably about after 10 or so, uh, gets to be pretty high. Um, pup survival rates are fairly low. And all of this that I've just told you, and there's much more that we know about these Weddell seals, but all of that information, for the most part, comes from um, McMurdo Sound in Erebus Bay, where that star is located. And that happens to be in one of the, or in the uh, southernmost location for the species. And that's a population that's been studied in perpetuity since the 1960s. And so we have a lot of really valuable information about Weddell seals. But that's about the only place where we have any, well, that is the only place where we have long-term information. And Antarctica is huge, as I've just mentioned. There's a lot of coastline where these seals could be, uh, could be. And so, you know, kind of in the in my mind, as I started doing work with Weddell seals, I was thinking to myself, how can we really know what's going on in the rest of the ocean when we really only have a little bit of information in this one spot? And to complicate matters further, one of the key prey items for Weddell seals is Antarctic toothfish, which is the animal that you see on your screen here. This is a fish that effectively um, has the same role in other oceans um, as sharks. So it's a very important Piscean predator. It's a mesopredator because not only do seals eat it, but it eats um, other animals such as um, Antarctic silverfish. And of course, it is also the uh, target of a commercial fishery and it ends up on our plates as Chilean sea bass. 
Now in the Ross Sea, um, there was a commercial fishery that started in the late 1990s and it's, it's basically been going on ever since. Um, and so putting all of that information, kind of keeping that in my mind, um, as I was beginning my PhD, I saw this potential issue or this, at least this question about, we have a lot of information about these seals in one spot, but not really anywhere else. And now there's a fishery that potentially could have an impact on, on seal populations. How on earth would we be able to really know whether or not this fishery is having an impact or not if we only have information from this one spot, right? So again, kind of keeping that framework um, in our minds. But then one day, and this is true, I was, uh, I was making a map um, working with the Polar Geospatial Center at the University of Minnesota right as I was, right actually before I was starting to, to think about doing a PhD. And lo and behold, I saw an image on a high resolution satellite image, which is about, at the time it was about 50 centimeter resolution. And I saw a little group of seals just like in that blue box, or excuse me, that blue circle right there. And I kind of looked at it at, for a second and I knew that it was right at the end of the Erebus Glacier Tongue and I'd been to the Erebus Glacier Tongue and I was like, I think those are seals. And I got really excited. And so I contacted as many people as I could, including David Ainley and Don Siniff, Jay Rotella and Bob Garrett. And the reason I reached out to those folks is because not only had, do they have decades of experience in Antarctica, but those are the guys who go down every year and do the surveys. And they're the reason that we have this long-term this long term data. So if anybody would know if those were seals or not, those would be the folks. And it turns out that, that we were right. And so immediately what I wanted to do was a proof of concept study. I wanted to see if what we saw from the satellite images were comparable to what we would, to what we would count on the ground or what those guys were counting on the ground. And so I found, um, I think five or six images that were uh, taken at the same time as um, some of the ground counts in Erebus Bay, just to see what, what we could find. And as it turns out, the comparison from uh, satellite imagery, so the counts that I did, um, thinking out of what I was counting and comparing that to the ground um, worked out really well. So what you're looking at here is just some of the results from that proof of concept study. On the x-axis, we have um, the image dates. And then on the y-axis, we have the counts of seals from the ground in the black and satellites in the gray. And so you'll notice the satellite counts are usually under counts um, from the ground counts. But in other words, this was a really great uh, uh, way forward. Um, it was really exciting to realize that we could actually watch um, trends and the changes that we were seeing and from the counts on satellite images were actually real. So that was really exciting. Um, and so I was like, all right, we're gonna do this, but how are we gonna do this? Because there's a lot of ice to cover. There's thousands of kilometers of fast ice where these seals could possibly be. And I am yet, I'm only one person. And even if I tried to pay, you know, lots of undergrads or something, it would still take a really long time to do this. And I had attempted a couple times trying to do some automated methods and those worked slash didn't work. Um, I kept looking at images kind of as I could, um, but that idea of being able to cover the entire coastline um, kind of languished for a few years until, I was telling that exact same story to my colleague, uh, Devin Libby at the Digital Globe Foundation. And I remember him very, um, very kindly listening to me just go on and on about this problem that I had. And finally he stops me and he said, Michelle, do you know who, who uh, Luke Barrington is? And I had no idea who he was, um, but Luke Barrington at that point in about 2014, 2015 had uh, developed a web, a web platform, a crowdsourcing web platform called Tomnod. And Tomnod was created um, at the time was really used for more kind of humanitarian and disaster relief. So the idea was being able to host these high resolution images online and anybody could come in and have a look at them and help find things like wreckage from, um, you know, from, from an airplane crash or to help find lost hikers. Um, that kind of a thing. And so it was this idea of the power of the crowd, the more eyes you can have on um, a huge area and the more people honing in on, on certain things that they think are interesting, the more likely it is that maybe there's something happening right there. So it was this really powerful tool 
um, that I had never heard of before. And I, uh, we thought that perhaps this would be uh, a way forward to understand what's going on with what else seals. And so then the question became after uh, meeting up with Luke and him giving the thumbs up and saying, yes, this sounds great, let's give it a go. The question then became, can citizen scientists help us count seals around all of Antarctica? This was a huge undertaking. I have to be completely honest, I didn't really know what I was doing when I first started this project, uh, but we thought we would give it a go. And after a few, I would say kind of like fits and starts because we thought, all right, well, let's just give it a shot and see what happens. And that was a really great learning process. So we could kind of come back and say, okay, how can we adapt and, and try to do to better uh, the next time? We did that once or twice and then realized pretty quickly that what we wanted to do first was effectively a search area reduction. As I've mentioned, Antarctica is very big. There's a lot of fast ice where these seals could be. So rather than asking people to identify them immediately, what we wanted to do was to narrow down the search area and say, okay, are they there or are they not? And so we basically played a game of seal or no seal with um, a lot of different people. And so of course we're going to play right now. Um, Raise your hands if you think you see seals in this image. And I'm going to check and see how you guys are doing. Nice. Yeah, okay, I see a lot. I see a lot of hands. Very good. You guys are good at this. See? <laughs> this is it's, it's fairly straightforward, right? So this is the this is the um, the pink box that we're asking you to vote whether or not you see a seal. What you're looking at here, of course, is the ice. Here's a crack in the ice. And all those little black dots are our little Weddell seals. Um, and just to note too, when uh, later on I'll be mentioning maps, um, this is basically a map. So that pink box, whoops, um, that pink box is, uh, is a map. Um, and, and each image is comprised of thousands of those, those little maps. All right, how about this one? Does anyone believe that they see a seal inside the map on this image. Excellent. There are no seals on this image. This again is, this is fast ice. Um, this is an iceberg, this is open water, but there aren't any seals on this image. And the last one is this one, which is kind of a difficult one, but any seals on this image? I'm watching the little ticker go up and up and up. 19 hand participants raised their hand. Awesome, yeah. So this one's a little bit more difficult. Um, the, the image is washed out a little bit, um, but yeah, there's definitely seals in here. You can kind of see uh, a couple congregations right here and also right here. And so uh, we, we felt that this would be a nice way to fairly quickly narrow down the area where we would then go back and find seals. And so as this campaign is happening, again, we had to look around the entire, um, the entire coastline, uh, which is huge, uh, we decided to uh, to start in the Ross Sea and kind of then work our way around clockwise. And so we ended up getting information about um, presence and presumed absence for seals in the Ross Sea first. And the reason we focused on the Ross Sea was for a couple of reasons, but prob probably primarily because that's the place where most of us authors had uh, and collaborators had a lot of experience. So um, you know, a lot of experience in McMurdo Sound, um, experience flying up and down the coast doing aerial surveys. And so we had um, a little bit better of an idea of what we might expect um, as far as where people would be seeing them and we'd be able to do a little bit of correcting and things like that. So anyway, um, so we decided to focus in on the Ross Sea and we wanted to look at habitat outside of Erebus Bay. Um, and so we came up with uh, 15 different habitat variables that we thought would describe why seals are in certain spots. Um, and they were bio, bio, like biological variables. So looking at whether or not um, they were in close proximity to a penguin colony. Um, and then also physical variables like distance to the ice edge, um, the bathymetry depth, um, distance to glaciers, distance to shoreline, things like that. And we found some really interesting results. The first thing that we looked at was the Ross Sea as a whole. So um, again, that fast line, or that fast ice around the coastline within the Ross Sea. And some of the things we found were that the physical variables made a difference, distance to shore, um, the width of the fast ice. So the idea there is that wider fast ice um, 
keeps them safe from, um, from any uh, marine mammal eating killer whales. Um, and they use cracks in the fast ice. So they don't need to be able to get all the way out to the ice edge. They can just you know, use the safety of, of the fast ice um, to, do their, to do their foraging and to raise their pups. But one of the interesting things that we found that, you know, we put it in our models because we suspected that there might be some sort of relationship, but I honestly wasn't really expecting to see an effect of um, distance to Adelie penguin colonies, which is what we see here. And then also an effect of the size of the nearest emperor penguin colony. So in other words, they prefer to be farther away from um, Adelie penguins and they can be nearby emperor penguins so long as the colony size isn't too big. So that's for the Ross Sea as a whole. But then we decided to look at kind of micro regions within the Ross Sea and we split it up into um, these sections that you see in A, B and C, which is East Antarctica, south of the Drogalski Ice Tongue, which is, which is down in this area, and then north of the Drogalski Ice Tongue. And the reason we use the Drogalski is because it's a huge landscape feature, um, particularly along the Northern Victoria Land coast here. Um, that would reason reasonably have uh, make a difference in the um, the fast ice dynamics. And what we found there was also really interesting that depending on where you are, the physical variables um, in each of those sections really was different. So uh, what describes seal presence in east in the eastern part of the Ross Sea and the southern parts of the western Ross Sea were a little bit different, particularly with regard to ocean depth. Um, and so we thought this was pretty interesting that there seems to be kind of like an optimal ocean depth um, when you're farther south of the Drogalski Ice Tongue. But for some reason, when you're in East Antarctica, they really like to be near uh, nearby deep water. Um, and that just very well could be a, an artifact of the fact that the water's deeper over there. Um, and so that was really interesting. It was kind of a first insight as to how we might do this again in the future, um, applying this around Antarctica. And it also gave us a regional scale idea of habitat uh, for Weddell seals in the Ross Sea. And so as we focused on the Ross Sea, seal or no seal did indeed continue. And eventually we got done with the entire coastline with the exception of um, the Western part of the Antarctic Peninsula. The reason we didn't look there is just because the fast ice there is decreasing fairly substantially. And furthermore, there are a couple other species out there that could be confused, um, like little black dots on, on white ice or even potentially on beaches. Um, there's elephant seals, there's fur seals. Um, and so this is an area that we opted to, uh, to not look into. Um, but we, what we found here was really impressive actually. First of all, um, we were able to search um, an area of fast ice, the same size as New Zealand, in the course of about six months or so, with hundreds of thousands of volunteers who came on to Tomna to help us out. Um, but then ecologically, biologically, the things that we found were really interesting too. And that, and that was that we found seals present on only 0.55% of all of the fast ice that was available in 2011. Um, this is, again, I didn't really have a, a numeric hypothesis coming into this. I didn't know exactly how much, what pr proportion of fast ice the seals would have been on, but I really would have thought it would have been more than 0.55%. Uh, and the other thing we found is that these animals are not uniformly distributed. So that I think that used to be kind of a, uh, an assumption that we would make is that they could be kind of just anywhere on the fast ice. And certainly they're very patchily distributed. Um, and then finally, one of the other things that we noticed as uh, through this process that became very important in the future was that people really over-identified seals. They didn't miss any, and I do mean like they didn't miss any seals. If there were seals on a map, they absolutely found them, but they also over-identified all kinds of maps where there actually weren't seals. So this was a huge learning process as well. So now that we had kind of an idea of how to go about doing some analysis in the Ross Sea, we know where the seals are located, we can then use their biology to our advantage. Um, and because seals are phylopatric, and because we are looking at them in um, November, by the way, these, all of these images are of um, November, this is when we are detecting reproductive females. And so kind of as much as we can, uh, we know that we're looking at the breeding population for the most part. And so that means that we can go back to these places where the crowd found all of these seals, and then we can go back and count them. So again, looking at this kind of starting out at a really huge scale and narrowing down to a much smaller proportion of places where we then go in and ask people 
to count them. And the idea here is that um, kind of along with the, the same, it's the same algorithm uh, used for the, the uh, search area reduction, but the idea here is that we can use the wisdom of the crowd and um, this consensus-based algorithm called CrowdRank to, to basically determine what is a seal and what's not a seal. And this is just to give you an idea of the difference between the two, um, the two campaigns. The first one was just saying, do you see them? And the second one is actually saying, okay, put the, put the seals in the crosshair and, and click on all of the seals that you happen to see. So as you might imagine, this got a little bit more complicated and fairly quickly. So I wanna talk a little bit about how CrowdRank works um, because uh, again, as you might imagine, having thousands of people coming online and even coming back to just the few locations where we know seals exist, how do we how do we know people aren't just clicking randomly? How do we know um, you know how good people are at this? Um, I, I personally happen to be fairly good at it because I've been doing this for quite some time. But you know, other people may not have nearly the same um, expertise or experiences that I've had looking at seals from space. Um, and so we needed a way to to basically figure out kind of who to trust and who's good at this and maybe who's not. And that's the algorithm called CrowdRank. So the way CrowdRank works is if you can imagine three different maps. So again, um, keeping in mind a map is that little um, pink box that we had that was about 500 meters by 500 meters. So we still kept that space as um, the map definition. So if you have these three maps and Jim comes along and he identifies what he thinks is a seal on maps one, two, and three. And without seeing what Jim has done, Beth comes by and she happens to see the same three maps and identifies the same feature on, as Jim did on map one and map two. And she sees map three, but she doesn't think that there's anything on there. And so she, kept, she keeps going. And then there's Todd and Todd comes by and again sees the three same maps as Jim and Beth did, but he tags something else entirely on map two. Like, so he sees what Jim and Beth saw, but he thinks something else is, is a feature on map two. With only that information, with just a couple of people looking at this, you basically have a flip of a coin, right? The, the likelihood that any one of those features is actually the feature we're interested in is kind of, is just kind of up in the air, right? Um, it's, it's really difficult to tell with just that minimal information. But if you have dozens of people, you know, more than 20 people looking at those same three maps, and then also the more than a million maps that we ended up look, actually looking at, um, you can start to converge on consensus. And so if you have 20 people looking at the same three maps and everybody's agreeing with uh, Jim for the most part and Jim and Beth on maps one and two, and nobody agrees with Todd, then the likelihood that each one of those features um, is a feature of interest increases and then Todd's decreases because nobody's agreeing with him. So it's a consensus-based algorithm the more likely or uh, the, the features are more likely to be a feature, the more uh, people who agree that it is a feature, if that makes sense. So as we have all of these tags and people are going through and tagging as much as we as much as they can, and us also kind of knowing that people are going to be tagging things that are not seals because we know that they're they're kind of over um, over identifying things. Now, what do we do? Do we just trust the crowd? Or do we need to go back through and do some sort of kind of checking on our own? And the latter is what we ended up doing. Um, and so at this point, we then went back and did another ground validation, just like we did at the very beginning of this presentation, using the information from Erebus Bay um, and all of the work in the ground surveys that uh, Jay and Bob and Don have been doing over decades to really hone in on uh, the crowd's ability to determine what's a seal and what's not a seal. So what you're looking at here is a map of Erebus Bay um, with North being, true North being uh, directly, directly up. Um, and each of these numbers represents um, a different kind of haul out location. So these are all places basically where there is a tide crack or there's, um, there's some sort of crack in the ice where the, the mothers can get out of the ocean and raise their pups on the fast ice without a whole lot of, of disruption. Um, and these are the places where they congregate routinely every single year. 
And so we were able to, again, use that information along with um, dozens of images that were taken on the same day, actually, as some of these ground surveys that were done on the ground. So we had the ability to have the, uh, the crowd counts, basically, on images that were taken on the day as, um, as a an actual ground survey. So we had a really great opportunity to test whether or not the crowd is actually good at this. And what we ended up doing um, was not just uh, believe in the crowd, and I'll show you a little bit as to why. Um, what we ended up having to do was correct for their bias and then um, continually calibrate the counts to, uh, to basically, pretty much what we did is we had to, because we know that they were, oh, were over-identifying things, we kind of had to shrink them back down and then calibrate back up to what the population estimate would have been on the ground at the exact same time. Um, and to do that, we, uh, we also accounted for other things like sensor type, um, time of day, day of year, and I think that was about it. So just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about here, this is a, a, a map or a, excuse me, a graph of just the crowd counts. So remember that each person has, um, and each feature has a threshold or a crowd rank score. So the higher the score, the more likely it is that people are agreeing with you. Um, and so each of these thresholds are 70 to 95%. So the 95% score are the people or the, the features where a lot of people are agreeing that these are features. But as we were looking at this and as we were analyzing it, this did not compare at all to the expert, which was me. Um, so I also looked at all of these images and put counts on as a participant in TomNod. And the comparison between me and even the people with the, with the threshold between 70 to 95% wasn't, wasn't exactly correct. Um, so in other words, filtering with just the crowd rank score alone, so being able to say that, oh, if you get a score of 80%, you'll be great. Or if you have a score of 90%, it'll be fine. We had to do more than that. We couldn't only use the crowd rank score. And so what we ended up having to do was basically, as I mentioned, we had to take the crowd rank scores and then shrink it down to what, were, what was actually there. So shrink it down to what I counted on the images at the same time um, and then go from there. But the problem with that is that when we did it that way, um, the number of people and the number of features, sorry, the number of people who had um, really good scores decreases. So that's what you're seeing here is, is people who had um, a threshold of about 70%, so they agreed with, or they had a 70% score. Um, there's a lot of them. But then by the time you get to people who have 95% uh, score, um, there's very few of them. So there's a kind of this balance of okay, well, we, if we only have um, a few people that we can really trust and apply it outward, that doesn't really help. So we had to strike this balance between the threshold and being in agreement with me. Um, so in other words, the idea of using the crowd alone um, was not reliable and we had to do a little bit more work to, to kind of calibrate that. So what we ended up doing then is, as I mentioned, taking those, the, the number of features that people were identifying shrinking it down to what I counted, which is about half, and then reinflating it back up to the actual population estimate. In addition to that, we then took into account the sensor type because there were different types of satellite platforms. We took into account the time of day and the day of year. And with all of that information, we arrived on um, the graph that you're looking at here, which was a fairly reasonable um, way to predict uh, the abundance of seals using all of that information and, and having that compared to the ground. So it was a, the point being, it was a lot of work to go from um, asking people to count a bunch of seals. It wasn't just a matter of us trusting the crowd. Unfortunately, we had to do a little bit more work there to really be able to get some sort of um, reasonable approximation of the abundance. Because ultimately what we wanted to be able to do was not only do this in Erebus Bay, we needed to be able to do this elsewhere where we don't have ground counts, right? So we had to be able to have some sort of reasonable way of predicting abundance. And so we took all of this information, this new algorithm that my colleague Leo Salas uh, created, and that was, that was all his work um, on the statistics. And we applied that to all of the tags that we had around the continent. And we arrived at the first ever population estimate for Weddell seals. And we found that there's about 202,000 
um, female uh, breeding, basically female Weddell seals in Antarctica as of 2011. Some of the key pieces of information that um, I at least thought was really interesting is that still the Ross Sea um, definitely has the greatest proportion of Weddell seals of all of the, the different regions that we looked into. Um, the Ross Sea, which we basically defined as right about here, um, has about 41% of the world's population of Weddell seals. And interestingly enough, um, the Amundsen Sea, which is this area right here, definitely had the fewest. I wanna say that was somewhere around 15% or so of, of the population of Weddell seals. The other thing that we found, um, in addition to this being the, the first estimate, was we went back through and looked at the habitat variables, the same exact habitat variables that we looked at in the Ross Sea. Um, we wanted to know uh, if, you know, distance to fast ice edge, with, you know, bathymetry, the ocean depth, um, distance to glaciers, distance to shoreline, and whether or not penguins had an influence on the presence, so this was just the just presence of, um, of Weddell seals. And interestingly enough, the relationship between the penguins and the seals held at the continent level. So what you're looking at here is our results suggesting that indeed seals prefer to be um, farther away from Adelie penguins. So there seems to be like kind of this, this peak at about, I think it's about three, three kilometers or so. Um, and, then it, and then it declines off from there. Um, and I realize I've gotten feedback about this graph, but I just haven't, haven't uh, revised it, unfortunately. But this is a two-dimensional partial dependence plot looking at seal presence here, the emperor penguin abundance on this axis, and then the distance to the emperor penguin colony. And so in other words, what this is showing is that uh, Weddell seal presence is greatest when it is um, close to a small group of emperor penguins. Um, and I will say that that was, that was something that I kind of had expected after having been, um, you know, after having been a participant on this Tom Nod campaign, um, I could kind of tell uh, after a little while of, I would be like searching, searching and searching and then I'd see a group of, of uh, Weddell seals and I'd start tagging them and then they'd keep moving. And then would kind of like trail off and there might be like one or two and then I wouldn't see anything for a while. And that's when I knew there was gonna be an emperor penguin colony. And then all of a sudden, boom, there's this like big brown stain and then there's an emperor penguin colony. Um, so certainly, uh, and again, that, that happened upon reflection. I was like, oh yeah, I do, I do think that that makes uh, a little bit of sense. Um, so this was interesting because uh, in the Ross Sea, we found the same type of, uh, of relationship, but at the time I didn't, not, we're not really sure exactly what's happening here. There could be some sort of um, interspecific competition happening. Um, maybe uh, Weddell seals and emperor penguins can both dive very deeply. Um, on the other hand, Adelie penguins and Weddell seals both go after Antarctic silverfish. So um, there could be a couple of things happening here, but it was really interesting that these relationships did hold at the continent level um, the same way that they did in the Ross Sea. And so for some reason, um, the seals are not really a penguin, not really fans of penguins, it seems. Um, and again, this is one of those things that we now, uh, or at least I feel, is important to kind of follow up and do some more, uh, do some more modeling, gather some more data and figure out what what might be happening here. Um, so definitely a lot of new research to look into, particularly when we are thinking about communities, uh, community ecology, and actually thinking about the ecosystem as a whole. Um, a single indicator species can only tell us so much, right? And so if we can have a better understanding of how these communities of, of indicator species, the penguins and the seals, um, are doing and how they are relating to the environment, relating to each other, that should give us a better understanding um, and a better idea to, to feed back to the Camelar science process. And so to conclude, um, just to kind of uh, summarize a few of the things that we were able to do here, um, we were able, to, uh, I'm, I'm really, really uh, fortunate and feel really, really lucky that we were able to make several leaps forward here. The first of which is of course, learning um, you know, regional habitat for Weddell seals and getting some sort of glimpse that there may be something to do with penguins there in addition to some of the physical variables. 
probably in addition to knowing that there's only 200,000 wet L seals in Antarctica, female wet L seals in Antarctica, um, the fact that they're available or that they're present on very little ice around Antarctica, I think was really surprising to me. Um, I definitely would have thought there would have been more, but I will say that uh, again, that that holds. Like as, as we had this online forum and people were searching for seals, probably the biggest question that I got on the online forums is why am I not seeing so many seals? Like I've gone through 400 maps and I haven't seen anything yet. Um, and my, my thought at the time was, okay, well, Antarctica is, is very big. There's a lot of fast ice. Of course, you're gonna be going through, you know, big swaths of, of area where there aren't any seals. But it seems to be unfortunate that there really are entire sections of, of coastline with very few seals and they're, they're very patchily distributed. Um, thirdly, I feel like uh, it was a really interesting test of this idea of the wisdom of the crowd because as I had mentioned previously, um, Tomnod had only been using um, Tomnod for um, you know, disaster relief and for for those kinds of things that hadn't been used for a research purpose at that point. Um, and so we ended up having to, to be very creative with how we use the platform and then of course coming up with a new algorithm to not only be able to use the power of the crowd, but then also be able to hone it more specifically for exactly what we needed here, which was to count what else yields. Um, I think the fact that there were only about a quarter of the seals that we thought was was really interesting. I had a feeling that we were going to have fewer, but not that many fewer. Um, the previous kind of world estimates for wet L seals that, that I had seen was somewhere around the order of about 800,000 800, or so. Um, and those estimates were based on, um, I think, shipboard surveys and some aerial surveys from back in the 1970s and 80s. So it was a, quite a while ago. It's also a different way of going about um, gathering data and doing um, estimations. So I wouldn't necessarily say they're directly comparable, um, which is why we, we do say in our paper, and I do believe that this is probably a better, the better way to think about this is that we didn't, we didn't decrease, we just have a baseline as of 2011, currently in November of 2011. And finally, apparently there still seems to be something going on with the penguins, which I think um, is really interesting. And as somebody who also studies penguins from space, um, this is a really exciting avenue and a pathway forward. But I think most importantly, um, and I, I tend to end up with this slide on purpose because of all of the things that we have, that I've been talking about here and thinking about, you know, ecosystem-based management and understanding what's going on with the ecology of the species. Why are we, why do we conserve these animals in the first place? Why do we care about these animals? And it's because of our younger generations. And I wanna live in a place where our younger generations can live with wet seals and understand wet seals. Um, and so this is a picture of a young girl who, um, whose mom I actually went to high school with and I hadn't talked to her since high school. And she emailed me, or I think maybe Facebook me, um, right as we were doing a press release for our first, um, our first search area reduction for SEALs. And her daughter heard, uh, heard the interview on, on NPR. And she, she said, oh my God, mom, this is so exciting. And she ran home and went online and this is a picture of her actually helping us do our work. And so to see the excitement in, uh, in a young girl like this and hopefully uh, you know, thinking about the fact that maybe others were doing the same and knowing that their work fed into a huge leap forward in our understanding of our southernmost continent and the ocean around it is a really humbling experience. And so I always try to end with that in mind that you know, we're scientists and ecologists and, you know, biogeographers and policymakers, but why are we doing this? And for me, it's, it's because we want to make sure that our younger generations know that they can make a difference and that the difference that they're making will ensure the longevity um, of these species into the future. Thank you so much. We enter now the Q&A session. Uh, I think we have a question from Josh, and then after I've got a question for, in the chat. Josh? Yeah, thank you so much, Michelle. That was a great presentation. Uh, fascinating uh, using uh, satellites. Um, my question is, uh, how did you deal with overlap in species or, or, or identifying species, for instance, from the more abundant crab eater seals uh, from Weddell seals? Because crab eater seals seem to dominate the, the area, especially because there is a lot of shared space between those species. How did you differentiate or, or correct for that error? 
Yeah, so um, what we did what we did there is uh, we very uh, conveniently were looking in November when crab eater seals are out in the pack ice. And so they are, um, uh, they, they basically differentiate their habitat during that time of year. So on, on the fast ice in November, as the Weddell seals are raising their pups, the likelihood that you are seeing a crab eater seal is almost nothing. Um, they're gonna be raising their own pups in the pack ice during that time. Um, it will become more complicated if we ever decide to do this in say like February or March when kind of lots of lots of animals are gonna be taking up the same space and you would see potentially an influx of, of crab eater seals along with, with Weddell seals. But during November, um, that's a time frame when they, they are kind of spatially segregating themselves. Thank you. We have a question in the chat um, from Seisman Soma. How did you identify seals to the species and by habitat only, especially in partitioning? And can you estimate the number of males somehow using sex ratio, for instance? Yeah, so so the, the seal, the identification of species is just because they're on the fast ice. So because they're on the fast ice in November, those are Weddell seals. So that's that's how we did that part. Um, the males is really difficult to do because um, the way Weddell seals situate themselves is that in November, at least, well, almost all the time, actually, but particularly in November when the when the females are raising their pups, um, the males are almost exclusively underwater defending their underwater territories and so that you, we can't see them. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the groups that do the ground surveys and the mark recapture studies also don't see them. Um, and that's how we were able to come up with it actually with a stable age distribution and saying, okay, we're very confident that the vast majority of the seals that we're seeing here are females because even over the course of the 40 or 50 years that the marker capture study has been happening, they only see, you know, wet, or, uh, male seals maybe 20% of the time. It's a very, very small amount of animals. And so assuming that that holds across the rest of the continent, um, that's an assumption that we were making. Thank you. We have a question from Rashid Sumaila. Okay, now I can mute so you can hear me, right? Yeah. Thank you for the talk. I mean, I, given that I, I'm, I'm not a modern mammal person, you know, I learned a lot and, uh, and I like your crowd rank uh, algorithm. Thanks for introducing me to it. And I think it could have use by some of our students and colleagues here. So that is great. Now, when it comes to the Rossi, my main relationship with it is this uh, information that it is the first high seas uh, marine protected area. So my question is, uh, what can you tell us about that? And was your studies done before or after? And what would that mean for your study? That's a really good question. Um, so yeah, so the Ross Sea is now the largest uh, marine protected area in the world. It's I think upwards of two, th two million square kilometers. Um, and that came into force in two, I always, I think it's 2017. 2016, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and so the work, so the work we did um, was kind of as that was happening, but the images we captured were from 2011. So the first estimate and the baseline that we have is definitely prior to the MPA formation, but after fishing began. And so to be able to have a detection or some sort of signal about either, you know, an influence of fishing and or whether or not the MPA is having um, kind of the potentially the reverse effect or any effect at all um, is gonna take, I think, quite a bit of time and quite a few, you know, a lot more uh, data collection to, to determine that because these animals are very long lived the MPA has only been into force for a couple of years. So I do think from the perspective of being able to look at how many animals there are on the fast ice in November, over time, we can do that now. But whether or not we're able to be able to do the modeling to figure out if there's a signal about the MPA or, or the fishing, I think um, that remains a question in my mind. So thank you very much. Thanks. We have a question from William Chen. Thank you very much. That's a very, very interesting talk. And like what she said, I learned a lot from it. Uh, so I, I'm very interested in um, kind of the behind the scene of uh, of the projects. Uh, I know that, I mean, this, you present it in a, like a really, uh, I mean, this is a fantastic uh, projects like gel together, but I'm sure behind when you 
develop uh, ambition need from ambitioning to, to implementation. There are lots of uh, challenges uh, putting together a team that can allow yeah. you to do all of these things. So, so I, I, I would be interested to, to know um, like um, what's the, the main challenge, one of the main challenge that you you you, have, you encountered, uh, and maybe sharing your your experience of uh, like what what's the main lesson learned from it that uh, others like our students and, and colleagues uh, can can take uh, and 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 when we think about organizing these kind of projects. Uh, Ooh, that's a really great question. Um, hmm. I think my biggest, uh, I'm going to start with my lesson because then I'm hoping the the primary challenge, because I have a lot to choose from. <laughs> I'm hoping the primary challenge will come at some point. Um, yeah, so I think the biggest lesson for me was, was to surround myself with people who knew what they were doing. Um, so I had a very clear idea of what I wanted done, but the, like you said, the details of how to go about doing that takes not just one person. You have to have the 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 team, like literally it was a team of people who, you know, Leo was the, the quantitative ecologist who totally took on board, making sure that um, that we were sampling, well, we sampled everywhere, but then making sure that the statistics were done correctly. We had a sea ice person, uh, Dr. Sharon Stammerjohn, who was there to, you know, help us um, interpret what we were seeing from our results, interpret what we were looking at when we were looking at the images to make sure that we that we had it right. Um, we had Dr. David Ainley, who is um, a well-renowned, you know, world-renowned ecologist with both penguins and seals. Um, and then very importantly, we had the folks from Tana, and we had Luke and uh, Costas involved, and they had, um, and I probably, I would say from a, from a logistics and kind of operation standpoint, I probably worked with them more closely just because my background was in GIS and, and mapping and things. And so I could kind of speak that language fairly well. And so what we did um, was a lot of planning and um, thinking about how to do this effectively. And so I would say one of the challenges that we came across was from a mapping perspective, Antarctica is, uh, is very difficult, right? It's at the south, it's at, centered on the South Pole. And so one of the issues that we had was we couldn't just do a single campaign ho hosting all of the images around the continent and have it show up on the web and have it make sense all in, all in the same projection. And so what we ended up having to do was to section out the continent so that North was always up, but we couldn't have it be too big, right? Because otherwise at some point then, then things start to be off and it, being able to display it on the web was really difficult. So that was one thing, um, I think one challenge that we came across. Um, another challenge I think was just in the, the fact that the way Tomnod was originally sent, set up was kind of backwards from what we ended up doing. And so we had to communicate really effectively about, okay, what we actually need. Like we don't just need the tags, we also need to know who tagged them, we need to know. It's like, so we needed a lot, I think a lot more detail rather than just saying like, oh, 15 people agreed, that's probably a seal. It's like, no, we need more than that. We need to know who saw it. We need to know who tagged it. Um, we need to know who missed it. Um, you know, it was a little bit more detailed than that. So I think, um, I guess one of the lessons I learned here was to definitely be very flexible and have an overarching structure of what you wanna do and then be able to be nimble within that structure because things are gonna change, like things changed constantly. Um, and you need to be able to to adapt to that and work with kind of work with what you've got without stressing yourself out too much. Yeah, um, we'd like thank to thank uh, Michelle on behalf of all of UBC's Institute for Oceans and Fisheries. Um, so appreciate you being here and sharing your knowledge about uh, Antarctica um, and the seals that inhabit that area.